Since the fall of man, a war has raged between good and evil. Over the centuries, this war has distorted the truth. Now the truth is perceived as lies, and lies acknowledged as truth. To this day, the battle continues as we investigate and debate the truth behind the history and mystery of the universe. We are Paratruth Radio. Hey everybody, welcome to Paratruth Radio right here at paratruthradio.com as well as Spreaker.com. My name is Justin. And I'm Eric. And uh, we are coming at you live at 8 p.m. Eastern Time today. Uh, We've got a great show here for you. Um, Eric finally has finished up his uh, filming, so I'm sure he's (coughs) finally happy to have a day to himself. I, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty much a day to myself. I just got, we just... (laughs) We had the rap party early, earlier today, so uh, I was gone for a few hours, came home, and passed out, and almost forgot about the show. <laughs> I didn't have an alarm or anything, and luckily, it's raining here, and it dropped like 30 degrees since yesterday, and I woke up to absolutely everything by my window and my computer being completely soaking wet from rain, oh, and I'm like, oh, crap, everything's wet, and it's cold, and oh, God, it's... 750 something. <laughs> uh, oh, goodness. Well, it could have been game over. <laughs> <laughs> could have been. <clears throat> I can smell you. That's what creepy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Well, if you want to join us in our chat room, you can come over to paratruthradio.com and click on the Listen Live tab, and you will get over to our chat room. The player will start playing automatically there for you, so that way you're hearing the show right away. There is a slight delay, so if you guys are asking us questions in our chat room, we will get to them, and uh, we'll have that towards the end of the show. So uh, today we have on Chad and Alta Dillard. Are you guys there? We sure are. Thanks for having us. No. We're here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for our listeners that haven't heard of you guys, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Well, first of all, we'd like to thank both of you for having us. Uh, Chad and I are what we call experiencers of, I, I call all of this paranormal stuff, uh, I borrowed this term a long time ago, high strangeness. We are experiencers of high strangeness, it seems, of all caliber, <laughs> but we, um, we decided to start speaking out publicly after several years of uh, high strangeness taking the form of UFOs, um, what we call being taken, and, uh, you know, all of that kind of category seems to be pretty predominant in our world, but prior to that, you know, both of us have had had encounters with ghosts, I call it all ghosties, and, um, again, paranormal almost it seems like in all forms. Now, when did this actually all start for you guys? Uh, for me in particular, I'm 10 years older than Chad, born in the late 50s uh, on a reservation in Arizona. I'm of mixed native blood. Um, my mom left that area when I was about six months old, and she claims now she's not living any longer, so I don't have her physically to ask any of these questions from, but I remember as I'm growing up, she would, when she was comfortable, which wasn't real often, tell people that when I'm, when I'm six months old, she's driving across the desert. I don't know what desert she spoke about, but she says that while she was driving, and I'm the only passenger in the car during the daytime, she claims that a UFO or a craft, sometimes she would say a metallic craft, came down out of the sky and literally landed on the road and stopped her. Um, I'm, I'm more sorry than anybody that I don't have any more information about that experience because... I was always so embarrassed when she ever brought it up that I would just kind of crawl away and hide. 
<laughs> I didn't want to hear. And people she would say it to seem more shocked than ever, you know, just hearing such words that they would never ask her any other questions about it. So that's really all that I know about that particular experience. But I can honestly say it, it seems like in my life it's been happening all my life. Um, as far as uh, paranormal or high strangeness, that seems to have followed me also throughout my life. Encounters with spirits or ghosts, um, missing time kinds of encounters, various forms of, as I say, paranormal. I have Chad share with you the couple of experiences in his childhood. Okay. Uh, yeah, this was uh, probably when I was uh, uh, six, seven years old. Uh, my my dad was a um, farmer in uh, in Arkansas, and um, outside our, our house uh, one morning, uh, my dad and my grandfather and my uncle found these three burnt circles out in the middle of this uh, soybean field between uh, our house and uh, the uh, the uh, shop where they kept all the tractors and stuff. And um, another time I remember uh, my dad telling me about uh, a time that um, him and my stepmother coming home and uh, the house being rearranged, uh, you know, furniture, uh, things on the wall. So, you know, uh, those types of situations, you know, things happened when I, I remember when I was younger. And uh, so the these instances just have been continuing to occur after your guys' childhood? Well, in particular, what happens with Chad and I is that I've always been convinced. We're, tw we're 25 years together now. Um, I've always been convinced almost from day one that an unseen force arranged Chad and I. I always call our marriage a union of arrangement. <laughs> um, a lot of high strangeness involved in us first meeting. And, um, and then just to kind of cap that off, it, after this weirdness of how we were brought together and mm. and actually came together, we discovered within a short amount of time that Chad's grandfather, who had already crossed over by the time I came into the picture, so I never met him in person, he went by the name of George. This is how the world knew him. But come to find out, his birth name that's actually on his tombstone is Alta, the same as mine. So that's just too weird for words because I have such an uncommon name, but I've, and I particularly have never heard a man with this name before. Right. And his last name, is, his, the grandfather's last name is Duncan, and that's my mother's name. So it just gets stranger and stranger. Right. That was enough, that was enough all in itself just in the beginning, 25 years ago, mm -hmm. for me. And then it just got... It just got bigger and bigger from that point on in terms of the high strangeness. So tell us a little bit about, because in your bio that you sent us that uh, it, in 1995 is when you guys had the encounter with the first UFO. Right, yeah, we, we actually, I'll have to add, describe that to you. We had a much better... Uh, view of that experience, I was in shock. I'll just preface that. I absolutely went into shock when we had our first encounter. I'm sure so everybody Chad would to... go into shock <laughs> seeing that for the I first time. I definitely did. Yeah, I absolutely did. <clears throat> yes, uh, we were coming in the uh, end town. Uh, uh, this, yeah, this, this happened in uh, Hannah, Louisiana. Uh, we hadn't been there long. Uh, we were coming into town one evening uh, for, for dinner. Uh, it, said it was it was not real light. It was still pretty light outside. Uh, we come around this group of trees uh, in the bend of the road, and back behind this group of trees was the local Walmart uh, shopping center. And when we get around the trees, Alton and I kind of look up in the air, and I would say below cloud level, uh, there is this craft, and it was it was huge. It um, it was black, uh, very um, very 
very, uh, I guess, it, it looked like a rectangle, but it was not as wide in the front as it was in the back. Uh, there was two or three lights in the front of it, two or three lights in the back of it, you know, up underneath. Um, it moved real, real slow, almost not moving. Uh, there was no sound. You are now listening to uh, Paratruth. It when after I kind of looked up at it, she looked back at me, I looked back at her, and it was if to say we never said anything to each other, but it was almost like we knew, okay, if we don't look at it, we don't acknowledge it, it won't see us. We, we went on about our business. I don't ever remember, you know, anybody acknowledging it or people you know, running off the, the road or stopping and freaking out or anything like that. Uh, we went on to dinner. Don't remember speaking about it or talking about it. Uh, went on home that after dinner. Uh, we, uh, we get home. We never speak about it next morning. Never speak about it. I do remember either in the newspaper or on the radio. Uh, other people had uh, reported this. So, uh, you know, it kind of gave us Acknowledgement that, uh, you know, we weren't crazy, that we weren't seeing things. Uh, but that was kind of our first um, counter with, uh, with Craft in the Sky. And when you guys were encountering it, um, did it, like, move towards you guys or anything? Or it just was floating there? Yeah, it was... Moving, you know, across the sky. As Chet said, it, it appeared to not be moving at all. So it had to have been that slow. Now, of course, I'm not staring at it because I'm in shock. It didn't happen as far as I was concerned. It was a non event. Right. But it, we, you know, again, as he said, with witnesses, we didn't have an option any longer to stay in denial about that. Yeah. But it was absolutely massive. It was massive. It was larger than the super-sized Walmart shopping center and parking lot combined. It was massive. <laughs> How long did this event uh, take place? Well, I mean, we only looked at it for a, a split second, and we were driving, so we just kept going. And never and looked back. Never looked back. We didn't turn our back and you know, look in the rearview mirror or anything like that. We just, okay. It didn't know, happen. If we don't acknowledge it, it didn't happen. Uh, it won't see us if we don't see it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, were you pretty confident that it might have been some kind of extraterrestrial ship as opposed to uh, something that the military had made up at some point? It was testing. I mean, what was it that really drew the, drew the fear out of you to keep on moving forward and not look back. Well, the size, for one thing, I mean, this was like a, you know, this was like a battleship, you know, it was huge, it was just, you know, it was a, it was a mothership, it was, it was, it was just so big, it was, you know, you probably could have landed, you know, four or five airplanes on this thing. Hmm. You know, or more. So bigger okay. than any ship that that we know of, then. Right, right. This was just too big to, to be something that you know we have. But right. honestly, at the time that this happened to us, I mean, what what I can recall before I turned my head in shock was, as I described it, like a floating city. Yeah. I mean, it took up the sky. It was that big. So whatever that is. I've never said alien, I've never said E.T. or anything of that nature in any of the interviews right. we've ever done. Mm -hmm. We just, we totally shut down. We didn't give it thought. Right. Mm -hmm. We didn't give it thought. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and I, I don't have a, any evidence to this because I was driving as well, but I had something shoot up out of nowhere into the sky that... Um, when I was driving to work one day, don't know what it was. It could have been just 
me mistaking something for for something else but what i saw was something shoot straight up into the air from the ground and then shoot away like it was moving away and i can't explain it um me and eric have talked about it on the show uh <laughs> and to this day i it's still in my memory but i can't explain what happened exactly that's it exactly and in all honesty chad and i would have never come forward publicly about that event because at the time that that took place we worked very hard to make that a non-event right so it it is what has followed since that has brought us out forward on what's happening with us Mm mm-hmm all right, well, um, I think we will take our first break. Folks, you're listening to Paratruth Radio right here at paratruthradio.com as well as Spreaker.com. And you can all also hear us on the Spreaker apps if you're listening on your phone. We encourage you guys to come on to paratruthradio.com, click on the Listen Live uh, feed, and uh, jump in our chat room. That's one way for you guys to give us uh, questions. You can also give us a call later today. I will give you guys that number when we open up the call lines to ask Alta and Chad questions as well. We'll take a uh, few minutes break, and we will be right back. This is David Montaigne, author of End Times in 2019, and you are listening to Paratruth Radio. This is the sound of salmonella gyrating on your undercooked chicken. And it looks like mom might be taking it out a little early. Don't let salmonella get funky with your chicken. On average, one in six Americans will get a foodborne illness this year. So use a thermometer to cook each type of meat to the right temperature. Keep your family safe at foodsafety.gov. Brought to you by the USDA, HHS, and the Ad Council. Ranger Station, Ranger speaking. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'd like to report a bear sighting location in the forest near the side of the road no need for alarm sir the forest is where bears live but this was no ordinary bear no ordinary bear at one second i'm having a smoke taken in the view next thing i know i am face to face with smoky bear let me guess smoky had a tip for you he did he must have seen me toss my cigarette on the ground he told me never to do that because it only takes one spark to start a wildfire he's a smart bear did you know that nine out of ten wildfires are caused by humans that means nine out of ten wildfires can be prevented that's what smoke Smokey said. I had no idea. That's why Smokey's famous, and you're not. Good point. If you see someone in danger of starting a wildfire, step in and make a difference, because 9 out of 10 wildfires are caused by humans. Brought to you by Smokey Bear, the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Learn more at SmokeyBear.com. Only you can prevent wildfires. Hey, guys, let's play some video games. This new dad plays video games with his sons. But the challenge feels like he's lifting a metric ton. So many buttons. His avatar just stares at the walls, twists and turns and somehow falls. Help me. He's tangled up in the controller's cord. I just don't understand this crazy digital world. Crazy, crazy digital world. But the love from his kids is totally apparent. Ooh. See, you don't have to be perfect to be the perfect parent. You should have just played catch. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of siblings in foster care will take you just as you are. For more information on how you can adopt, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. Hey, kids, let mom help with your science project. This new mom wants her kids' science project to thrive. Too bad she hasn't cracked a science book since 1985. A metathesis reaction? Compounds, mixtures, and elements. Even this baking soda volcano is too big of an experiment. Whoa. Now she's completely forgotten the periodic table. Now she's burning a hole through the kitchen table. Burning with science. But her kids' love for the mom is truly transparent. Proof you don't have to be perfect to be the perfect parent. Don't tell Dad. 
You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of siblings in foster care will take you just as you are. For more information on how you can adopt, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. Welcome back to The Dog Show. Up next, we have Satchmo. Satchmo is a member of the Shelter Pet Group. That's right, a group known especially for their couch-snuggling, ball-chasing, face-licking, tail-wagging, backyard-hanging, and, of course, companionship. And what breed would you say Satchmo is? I'd have to go with maybe a lavish terrier hound chihuahua-looking kind of mix. Tremendous dog. Mm, I'd also like to point out Satchmo's coloring, a white, gray, brown, black brindle, simply marvelous. You know, it's such a treat to watch a dog like this. Now, let's see him in action. Look how he makes eye contact with his person. That's actually known as the treat stare. How intuitive. And now he appears to be excitedly turning in circles. Ah, oh, the happy dance, so common with this group. And finally, the loving face lick. It's great how he just gets in there and, well, licks. Fantastic. But really, the best way to know an amazing shelter pet like Satchmo is to meet one. Visit theshelterpetproject.org today. Adopt. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. When I grow up, I want to be a new pair of blue jeans. When I grow up, I want to be a kid's first computer. When I grow up, I want to be a glass countertop in a new home. When I grow up, I want to be a kid's best birthday present. When I grow up, I want to be a football stadium. When I grow up, I want to be a warm place on a cold day. When I grow up, I want to be a fancy when backsplash. I grow up, I want to be a bike that races around the when country. When I grow up, I want to be a bench on a forest when I trail. Grow up, I want to be a rocking chair on when a sunny I up, porch. I want to be a skyscraper. I want to be a... 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 When I grow up, I don't want to be a piece of garbage. And if you recycle me, I won't be. Give your garbage another life. Recycle. Learn how at IWantToBeRecycled.org. A public service advertisement brought to you by Keep America Beautiful and the Ad Council. This is Bill Hall, author of the book, The World is Haunted House. Haunted House. You're listening. You're listening. You're listening. You're listening. Hey, folks. Welcome hey, back folks, to welcome. Radio. My name is Radio. Austin. My name is Austin. And I'm Eric. And uh, we've been and, uh, we've to been. Alta and Chad uh, about their encounters with what they call the uh high strangeness i'm sorry um so you guys um not only had an encounter with a ufo um you guys also um claim that you've been abducted as well is that right well again personally i've never used the word abducted but we do call ourselves experiencers. I oftentimes refer to it as being taken. Okay. Um, that absolutely has happened to Chad and I and another woman one evening. And what 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 kind of initiated it? What started happening? So Chad and I had moved to the French Quarter of New Orleans uh, later that year in 95 after encountering that first craft, uh, and it, within within the time of moving to the French Quarter, it was in 95, the end of 95, uh, it took us a couple of years of, of living there, working there, um, trying to build a good name for ourselves. We had moved into the heart of the quarter. We started off kind of on the outskirts, and then we moved into the heart of the quarter. I, at the time, was working in a actually very beautiful salon, and uh, we had hired, the, it was a family-owned business that had started their business in 1929. They had hired a young woman to manage the shop. Her name, Jacqueline. She was, at the time that this took place, Jacqueline was 24, never married, no children. Chad was 30, and I had just turned 40. Um, and again, Chad and I have no children as well. This particular evening, uh, Jacqueline had asked me if I wanted to go out and have dinner and drinks in the quarter that night after work, and I accepted. We called Chad to come join us. 
Jacqueline had driven to work that morning. She didn't live in the quarter. She lived on the other side of the river, and people who lived there either had their own car and drove, or they took a ferry back and forth. On this particular day, Jacqueline drove to work. She parked her car just up the street from our shop. That's important to remember to this story. Okay. Uh, the, shop was, the shop was on literally one end of the French Quarter. Um, the quarter was about 23 blocks or so square. We decided to leave the shop and just, you know, walk by foot uh, across the quarter and just stop at different restaurants and clubs and just see what was happening that evening. Because, of course, in the French Quarter, it never stops. It's a kind of a 24-7 party, if you will, and it's always busy. But on this particular night, the three of us walked out, out of the shop somewhere around 9.30, and all of us took note almost immediately that something felt strange. The, as they say, the vibe was off. It was very Twilight Zone feeling. And it's real hard to describe. Just imagine that your neighborhood that you're very familiar with doesn't feel the same. Okay. The air felt different and so on. So as we began walking down the famous Bourbon Street, we noted relatively quickly that there didn't seem to be any people on the streets. There were a couple of stragglers, but again, this is a, this is a town that never stops. Right. And there, there just were no people. And so, of course, we took notice of that right away, but not thinking anything paranormal or high strangeness, just weird. Mm. Kind of to speed the story up, it took us three stops along the quarter, from one end to the other, for us to determine that there were no people in any of the restaurants or the bars. They had one person in each place we stopped, and I remember three different locations, um, that person was either a manager or a bartender. We never stayed at any of them. We just, it was so bizarre that we just continued until we got to the other end of the quarter. By this time now, it's somewhere around 11 or 11.30. I've always felt it around 11-ish. And uh, we're out on a street corner, and I'm saying to Chad kind of privately, I'm so bored, I just want to go home. I didn't even want to walk the blocks back to our townhouse. I'm wanting him to get us a cab. That's how bad I wanted to go home. This was, as I said, around 11-ish. So we're out there for an hour and a half. <clears throat> We've always felt it important that people know we never drank, nor were there drugs, nor was there anybody around to drug us, because that would have been an easy excuse. Right. But absolutely, there was nobody around to drug us. Um, and that's, that's the last thing the three of us remember, was being on that street corner around 11 o'clock. Now, I'm the only one out of the three of us that, it's, that it would appear seems to be returned with memory of what I call the in-between experience. There's no memory whatsoever of coming off that street corner, but the next thing I know, I'm sitting up in my living room and it's the next day. I'm rubbing my arms and I have an object in my upper arm. I also have very strange handprints around both my arms. Chad has had regression since this has happened, hypnotic regression. Mm. And he has, uh, you know, in essence, a full account of what happened to him. And he thinks possibly Jacqueline. But in my memory of that night, I'm not with Chad and Jacqueline. And in his account of that night... I'm not with him or Jacqueline either. So if you're interested, we'll have Chad share yeah. with you that regression. Mm -hmm. well, well, in my regression, um, I remember uh, my, my first memory is, uh, you know, I'm on that street corner. It's about 11 o'clock. Um, and I notice this bright light coming from around the corner. I get the girl's attention and we walk around uh, to see this light. It, uh, it's probably about, it's about halfway down the block. It's about 12 foot off the ground. It's about uh, 12, 15 foot in diameter. And it's this bright white light. 
it comes towards us and just engulfs it. My next memory is I'm in this hallway. I'm walking uh, down this hallway. All the walls are very uh, are metallic, uh, very smooth, no bolts, no nets, stuff like that. No rivets. No rivets. Uh, there's a little being in front of me. I would say about three foot tall, big bulbous head, kind of a pale gray skin tone. Mm. Uh, I only saw him from behind. He was wearing a, a one-piece black uh, skin-tight jumpsuit. Uh, perfectly, I could see a tall, blonde female uh, beside me. Uh, this describes our friend Jacqueline, but uh, I didn't turn to look. Um, the, the being was, uh, you know, he, he was... He had this pale gray skin, but he wasn't like the ones that you see on TV, you know, real thin. He, he had substance. He was dwarfish. He kind of waddled when he walked. Okay. Um, my next memory is I'm in this uh, very huge room. Uh, it just seemed infinite. Very dark, very black. I couldn't see the walls. Uh, off to my left, uh, in the distance, I could see... A tall blonde female laying on an examining table. She was nude, but uh, she uh, her her whole body from head to toe was kind of censored, uh, almost like they do body parts on TV. Um, there were three beams around her, two at, at each side, and one of her head. Uh, they were very tall, eight to nine foot tall, I would say. Mm. Uh, wearing these long black cloaks, almost like a Jesuit priest or a Grim Reaper, but no, no hood. Uh, they're very uh, buggy or prey manacy looking. Their their mouths were close to their chin. Big uh, big eyes. Mm. Uh, kind of their arms were very uh, crooked. You know, bent. Uh, she never seemed to be in distress or anything like that. I focused my attention back to my immediate. I'm, I'm sitting in this chair, almost like a dentist chair, but much more comfortable. Uh, I look over to my right, and I see this little blue being. And he looks uh, a lot like the beings, that, like these grays that you see on TV, almond-shaped eyes, bulb his head, you know, little sit for a mouth. Um, but his, his skin, his being, this being was blue. And when I say blue, he was like this electric, vibrant blue. His aura, his presence was that of like a professor slash shaman slash scientist, healer, just all together. He goes over and he picks up this box. He has the box in his right hand. He takes his left hand and puts it inside the box. And when he pulls his hand back out, there's this substance kind of free floating a couple of inches above his hand. It was probably about um, the size of a quarter. Uh, it um, it was blue, just like him, and had little sparkly kind of metal flakes or glittery kind of stuff inside it. Uh, it's kind of thin, you know, kind of white, so you could almost see through it, but not. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a lot like that substance that, like, the kids play with, the slimy stuff, or Play-Doh or something. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he sets the box down, and he takes his hand, and he puts it up almost like, you see, depictions of Jesus or, or Buddha. There was only that four digits. So he's got two fingers up and almost like a peace sign, and his two outer fingers folded in. And when he does this, the substance starts spinning. And the faster it spun, the blueness and the sparkly stuff kind of dissipate out of it and kind of free floating around it. Um, and it would just move, it was just spinning faster and faster. And the faster it spun, you know, the uh, the clearer it got. And it started slowing down, and it turned into this little crystal. And, you know, it was very clear. It was double-pointed, 
kind of pyramid crystal. Mm-hmm. I remember thinking to, to myself or thinking to him, you know, why are you showing this to me? You know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not an engineer. You know, this is something very important. And he told me that I would know in time or win it time. My next memory is I'm in this other room. There's only three walls, two very straight, one bit and one kind of concave. There's this overstuffed leather chair in the middle of this room. I remember thinking to myself how out of place it is, and it looks comfortable, but it's not. I focus my attention to the, uh, the wall that's kind of concave, and what I thought was these, this metal, uh, solid gray wall, I, I noticed that I could see through this wall. And I walked a little closer to it. I was like five, six foot away. And I noticed um, that I could see through it. And I could see stars and planets. And, you know, I could see the galaxy. I was on some kind of craft, uh, I believe. Uh, I'm sitting there in awe. Uh, and then all of a sudden, this little craft but on the outside of... Um, what I'm on or this window uh, kind of buzzes past and it gets about 10, 15 feet uh, past me and it stops and it comes back. Now, it's only three or four foot outside this window, this wall window, and it's you know, right in front of my face. It's probably three foot long, probably two foot wide, kind of football shaped. Had little lights blinking on it and little wires and internet things moving around on it, chipping around. I could feel intelligence coming out of it. Um, it sat there for, you know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, and buzzed off again. And my next memory was waking up in bed the next morning. Wow. All right, well, I think we'll take our next break here really fast. Uh, we have Eric's Random Fact of the Day and our Paranormal Headline, and uh, then we will be right back with Alta and Chad Dillard. Now, Eric's Random Fact of the Day. Well, today I decided to go ahead and do two random facts today. The first one is very small and pretty interesting for me. The act of snapping one's fingers actually has a name. This is something I didn't know. It's called a Philip. Go figure. The second fact, though, is a little more uh, lengthy. And it's about duct tape. And we've all heard, of, well, we've all used duct tape numerous times. And we've even heard a story, or perhaps a rumor, if you will, that duct tape was once used on a, uh, during a space mission to fix something uh, back in 1972. And it just so happens that that is a true fact. But duct tape served a bigger role, or other big roles, also in space. In fact, duct tape has played a pivotal role in several NASA missions. The first one, as I just said, was in 1972, where Apollo 17 astronauts used it to repair a lunar rover bumper. In 2001, International Space Station astronauts and cosmonauts constructed a kitchen table using leftover aluminum pieces and... Guess what? Duct tape. And in 2005, the Space Shuttle Discovery astronaut Stefan Robinson crafted a hacksaw for, re for a repair mission using a blade, plastic ties, Velcro, and, believe it or not, duct tape. And now, Paratruth Radio's Paranormal Headlines. Justin here with your Paranormal Headlines. Gateway to Hell, Fiery Pit Found in China. Geologists have been investigating a glowing orange hole that opened up in a, on a Chinese mountain. The peculiar spec spectacle was first discovered around a week ago by builders and local villagers near Urumqi, the capital of China's 
Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. The intense heat and bright orange glow of the hole led to it being nicknamed the Gateway to Hell. A similar moniker to the Door to Hell, nature, natural gas fire in Turkmenistan, which has been burning continuously for over 40 years. The air blasting out of the hole is so hot that if you hold a branch near it, Near to it, it bursts into flames, said geologist Hu Tan. Although it is unusual, we're pr pretty certain that it has been caused by the spontaneous combustion of coal. His colleague, Kao Jia Wen, recorded a temperature of 792 degrees Celsius. This isn't actually the first time a pit like this has opened up in the region either, especially given the air given that the area had once been home to an active coal mine back in the 1970s. This one, however, is unlikely to be around for much longer as concerns over fumes emanating from the hole have prompted authorities to begin efforts to seal it off. I would not rule out that there could be similar sinkholes in this region in the future, said Jian Wen. Haunted doll causes nausea and chest pains. Videos and f photographs of the doll are said to have caused a range of symptoms in people viewing them. Known as Peggy, the allegedly possessed child's doll is now owned by Jane Harris, a paranormal investigator who has a keen interest in the unexplained and the occult. Head of the Haunted Dolls organization in Shropshire, England, Harris received Peggy from the doll's former owner who had been trying to get it get rid of it on the basis that it had been responsible for a, spa a spate of terrifying nightmares and inexplicable ill health. After she had acquired the doll, Harris started to use it as the focus of a series of YouTube videos showing her attempting to communicate with whatever spirit may be possessing it. Soon, however, reports started to emerge of people suffering a range of peculiar symptoms after watching the videos including headaches, nausea, and chest pains. One of one woman even reportedly had a heart attack after watching one of the videos. If I had to guess, I'd say close to 80 people have came forward with experiences, said Harris. One lady said that when she opened a f photograph of Peggy, her computer froze on the, com on the picture and the room went cold. She then said she felt someone in the room with her and could hear them moving around. I took Peggy down into an isolation area and requested that she cease her tormenting. Apparently, everything returned to normal. Despite receiving offers from other mediums to have their spirit expelled from the doll, Harris has opted to keep it around the con and continue conducting research on it in private. One of her video sessions with the doll uploaded her uploaded to her YouTube channel can be viewed below. This was a segment of Parachute Radio's Paranormal Headlines. All right, folks, welcome back to Paratruth Radio right here at paratruthradio.com as well as Spreaker.com. If you're listening in on Spreaker or on the Spreaker apps, come on into our chat room here at paratruthradio.com. Just click on the live show here, and uh, we can get your guys' questions for uh, Alta and Chad, as well as if you'd like to call in. We do have the line open now for you guys to call and ask questions. Phone number 701-204-4547. Um, so, Eric, I believe you had a question for our guests here. I do, I do. Now, uh, <clears throat> we often talk with people uh, who have experienced UFOs or alien abductions and so on and so forth. Uh, but you, both of you, have experienced a lot more besides just those over the years. And one of the things that I've... That I, that I read in your bio was something along the lines of uh, cryptids, in particular lizard monkeys. I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about those and just exactly what these are, what you believe they are. Well, uh, this is uh, when we moved to Alabama, 
Uh, we had gone on a, um, I guess, ghost um, hunt, I guess, if you want to say that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went to interview uh, this family, and we talked to this 10-year-old boy, and he said this was, uh, there's a lot to the story, but I'm going to go right to the lizard monkey thing. Okay. And, but uh, he, he said that uh, he was on his grandmother's front porch. He was kind of leaning over the, the railing, and he sees this creature come out from under the porch and it walks probably five, six foot um, out from under this um, porch into the yard and he said that it uh, looked like a monkey but it kind of had a lizardy skin mm -hmm. um, almost kind of reminds me of probably Chupacabra and the old boys, well, I'm not saying that it is, but um, he said that he gets it gets about six, seven foot uh, out in, in the yard, and it kind of looks back at him, turns back around, takes a few more steps, and just kind of disappears. Hmm. Uh, when we're sitting there talking to this little boy, it's not something that I believe that he made up. You could tell that he was matter of fact. He knew what he saw. He was, this was not some kind of crazy story. Mm -hmm. uh, and his family. His family. family uh, you know, this, there, was a, there was a lot to the story. You know, there, there was a lot of ghosts and different uh, things happening in, in, at this grandmother's house. Mm -hmm. grandmother had passed away, um, and, you know, his dad was in the other room, and these were some, you know, pretty tough-looking biker guys, with, yeah. you know, there was three of them, and, you know, they were very, you know, you could tell they were very upset and, you know, scared at this thing, too, so. Now, you said it uh, eventually took a few more steps and then vanished. Now, you, you tell me that it just vanished into some brush or it uh, almost yeah, just like dissolved as if a, a ghost would? Yeah, he said it just disappeared. Oh, okay. Hmm. There was also this little boy's mother was mm -hmm. sitting on the porch of this grandmother's, it was a mobile home, and this grandmother had died in this mobile home. And this daughter, this little boy's mother, granddaughter, was sitting on the porch reading out of the book of Revelations. Okay. And mm, I'll have Chad pick it back up from there. Just to kind of frame this crazy story for you, because when the adults got involved in this story, it was terrifying. The little boy, as Chad said, was matter of fact, and we took him very serious. But what we learned further about more of that event is mind blowing, as far as I'm concerned. Huh? Again, there was a lot of, of ghost things going on. So they're, they're, she's reading out of Revelations, uh, and all of a sudden, something grabs her by the head. Of, invisible, something grabs her by the head of her hair and starts pulling her off the porch into the, into the house. And her boyfriend or whatever, it, it pulls her down and starts pull, pull, you know, pulling her back into the house. The boyfriend and another guy grab her by the feet and they got her almost up in the air. And I mean, they're having this tug of war with her. Hmm. Hmm. That, I mean, I'm kind of flabbergasted right now. It's, it's actually yeah. a really interesting story. Um, and to me, that, I mean, that actually sounds like whatever was in the house was like manifesting this lizard monkey or whatever it was just to show that it was there. I mean, um, 
in all the accounts that I've heard of, any type of cryptid do just doesn't disappear into midair. They just go into the brush and you, you can't find them. Right. Again, each it seems that each member of this family, adult members of this family, there was a grandfather involved in another house. All of these folks lived within a driving range of each other, you know, fairly close. They were all being terrorized by the invisible. And when something would manifest, you know, such as this lizard monkey, mm -hmm. um, again, each and every one of these adult members were being terrorized in their individual homes. And that was enough for Chad and I to realize we're not going to go ghosty hunting no more. We're not going to get involved in stuff that we cannot explain any longer. And we got out because we became so afraid. Right. Hmm. Yeah, me and Eric, we haven't been on an investigation in, what, three years? Uh, four three, years? That's... Uh, I think three years. <laughs> I think <laughs> <laughs> it's been it's been a while. So yeah, um, I mean, we came across some weird things in our investigations, but I think it was always um, the question of what is this thing that actually kept both him and I going on with the investigations. I mean. It, uh, We've talked about it numerous times about, um, you know, we were um, saved at one point um, when, when we were doing another radio show and we were doing paranormal investigations and, you know, we, we kind of got a little bit more insight into what's going on just because Eric started doing more studying uh, and uh, it's really interesting to see the the different things that you guys have been through because i mean you guys have been through way more than anybody that i've ever come across so well if i may because jacqueline the third person taken with that mic mm -hmm. she's given us permission to describe her account and and it has to do with cryptid as well if you're interested okay so as I said to you when we began this, Jacqueline drove her car that morning to work mm -hmm. that we were taking that night. Mm -hmm. The next thing Jacqueline knows off is standing on that street corner with Chad and I, that's her last memory. And then her next memory is being put back behind the steering wheel of her moving car. And her car is no longer in the French Quarter. It's in another section of the city. It's moving slowly and it hit a parked car and it knocked off her rear view mirror. So this is what essentially jolted Jackman too. Now, prior to us being taken that night, Jacqueline had just broken up with a young man that she'd only dated briefly. Mm -hmm. This young man I called Dark Boy because he was quite cute, but he was he had a darkness about him. She didn't date him very long. Jacqueline's tall, slender blonde, as Chad described, and this guy is her opposite. When she decided to break up with him, she had him come over to her porch. You know, she did that on a porch and at, at her house, and it was broad daylight. She said that he was only a couple of inches in front of her face, and the short story on that is she said as she's basically saying goodbye to him, he's becoming so emotionally distraught that she said he literally turned into a wolf. She said she turned her head in shock. She said when she looked back, he must have flipped again because she said he did it a second time. She then called him on that, and she literally said, I'll clean the language up, but she literally said, you just turned into an effing wolf. And she said that with shock in his eyes and his voice, he basically responded to her with, you saw that, which confirmed to her she saw what she saw. Now, this is not a woman who is, uh, speaks, you know, that speaks fanciful. She's not dramatic. She's not a drama queen. She's not interested in any of this stuff. This is her truth, and we absolutely believe her, because when she's put back behind the steering wheel of her car, and it's moving, it's heading to his house. This is not somebody she ever intended to see again, and especially after this experience. Right. With the wolfy business. So, essentially, she says when she gets to his, his neighborhood, 
It's somewhere mm. between 3 and 4 in the morning. So she's got from 11 to that time missing completely. She said when she goes up to porch, normally his house is uh, locked with a big gate around it. But conveniently, the gate, the gate is open. And she said she stumbles up the stairs, you know, because she's been shot. She said he's sitting inside the door, either behind the screen door or the door is open, mm. under a light, playing guitar. She said he stopped playing guitar. He looked up at her and said, either we've been waiting for you or I've been waiting for you. I mean, just like a really creepy, bad movie. She said she became hysterical. We've never seen Jacqueline hysterical. It is not her way. But she said she became crying, hysterical. He led her and laid her down. She said she cried herself to sleep. She said she woke up probably an hour or so later, realized where she was. Nothing had happened to her. She's dressed. Uh, but she said she looked around and got the stuff out of there and never looked back. So, wow. you know, again, just to add to all the bizarreness of all of this. Right. <laughs> right. Mm. All right. Um, well, we are coming to the uh, close of the show here. So I just wanted to say thank you guys for being on the show. Um, it's definitely been interesting. I've I've never heard of so many things happening to, to, to two people or three people. So it's definitely been a privilege. And an honor for both of us, and we thank both of you and wish you the best. All right. Well, thank yeah, you so much. much. All right, um, I hope you guys have a good night, and then uh, maybe we'll try and get you on again and hear some more of the, the oddness that is a part of your guys' lives daily. That would be wonderful. <laughs> Thanks again for having us, and we look forward to it. Yes, we love that. We love sharing our stories. All right, have a good night, guys. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, folks, that was... Hold on. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, sorry. That was Chad and Alta Dillard. Uh, they have definitely had a weird and interesting life so far. Um, so that wraps us up for the most part tonight. Uh, next week, we are expected to have on Mark Belts. I'm hoping that uh, we can get a hold of him to confirm and uh, he is author of Blood Moons. And then a uh, week after that, uh, we've got on Gordon Melton. Of, uh, he wrote The Vampire Book, an encyclopedia to the undead. Uh, mm -hmm. But before we head out... Uh, let's get ready to rumble! I wanted to give Eric a chance to talk about his upcoming short film. I thought we were about to have an argument or discussion. <laughs> I was almost excited, actually. <laughs> like, debate time! <laughs> um, <laughs> well, as I had mentioned last week, and maybe the week before, I can't remember, uh, not much has been going on with my film that I've been talking about, The Revealed, uh, mostly due to another film that I've been working on, which is just wrapped, as I had stated at the beginning of the show. Uh, with that said... A lot more is going to be coming uh, of the revealed uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, location, a lot of location, a lot of a lot of location <laughs> scouting. Um, you know, location scouting for those who don't know exactly what that means. It's just finding places to shoot, to film, uh, places that I require to get the best shots uh, and make the film uh, the way that I want it, artistically and uh, story-wise. So, with that said. I just would really love everyone to, to tune in to or turn to uh, facebook.com forward slash the revealed movie. It's a story about a young author who finds herself in a bit of a predicament when she starts writing books in extraterrestrial life. Uh, it, it's definitely, well, I think, uh, kind of a nail biter, has you on the edge of your seat uh, through, through most of it, if not all of it, I would hope. Um, and I think it's really going to strike. Uh, uh, close to heart for a lot of people in the paranormal community, but also I think it'd be very interesting for those who are not in the paranormal community as well. Uh, I, I think 
people will learn a lot and even uh, raise some questions and not answer some questions for people as well. Uh, it's definitely a film I'm really looking forward to. I've been working on it for a long time now. Uh, it's been close to nine months that I've been writing this. Why so serious? Uh, I, I, yeah, you had to laugh. I was going to try my best to completely ignore that. And just, <laughs> um, so, with that said, uh, the revealed movie. Uh, look it up again. Facebook.com forward slash the revealed movie. Like it. Share it with your friends, with your family, uh, with anybody you can. Let's get as many people following, or liking it as possible. Uh, the more people I got, the better the film will end up being. Um, and I know that sounds a little weird, but trust me, the more people you're following it, the better these films end up being because it really drives the filmmakers and the people, uh, whether they're actors or you know gaffers, uh, the directors, the, the the writers, so on and so forth. Everybody. Uh, is more in tune and willing to put forward the effort to make it the best possible when they know that there's a backing behind it and the people are interested in this film. So I really appreciate everyone's help. Um, I'm going to say it one more time for a third time today because third time's the charm, you know. Uh, Facebook.com forward slash The Revealed Movie. Like it, share it, thank you. And uh, I've got it in the chat right here for you guys as well facebook.com forward slash the revealed movie uh like i said next week we've got uh hopefully mark builds coming on and um i encourage you guys to come to paratruthradio.com and uh hop into our chat uh that's the best way for us to see who's all uh, listening live as well as for you guys to give us some feedback for our guests uh even just questions to ourselves um we also have the open phone line now for you guys. Uh, it's usually on all the time, or you guys can leave voicemails now. So it's 701-204-4547. Uh, if you have any questions, any uh, likes, dislikes of the show, if you guys have any suggestions for guests or topics for Eric and I to cover, we have covered quite a bit in the nine months that we've been doing this now um actually 10 months that we've been doing this now and uh we are always looking for something new and interesting i mean alta and uh, chad actually found us we didn't find them so we definitely encourage you guys to reach out to us you can also email us at paratruthradio at gmail.com and uh hopefully uh we can get some good topics and a lot more guests on. I've got plenty of ideas, but I'm always interested for more. So on that note, we did it. We did it. We did it. Yay! <laughs> that's the end of the show for us guys. So we will talk to you guys next week. Same time, same channel, paratruthradio.com. I'm Justin. And I'm Eric. Have a good night guys. Peace.